Hello, everyone, and welcome to this open day for the BSc Computer Science and BSc Data Science and AI at the Creative Computing Institute. My name is Georgina, and I'll be your host today. So we're here to share all about these new two courses that we have at CCI, the BSc Computer Science and BSc Data Science and AI. And in order to do that, we'll have with us very special guests. We'll have Vali Laliotti, Director of Programs at CCI, Mick Grierson, who's the Research Leader at CCI, and Rebecca Fiebring, who's a Professor in Creative Computing at CCI as well. Before we start to give you an overview of how the session is structured. We're going to start by talking a little bit about the creative computing first. We've got a couple of videos which will walk you through the amazing spaces and facilities and resources that we have available to students here at CCI. And finally, we have another amazing video which will talk you through the research uh, and public program here at the Institute. After that, I will invite Dr. Valila Liotti to join us and she'll bring a, pre a presentation about the approach, the structure on the units that the BSc courses entail. Then we'll have a small presentation by Mick who will talk us through research on computer science and Rebecca will also be here to talk a little bit about research on data science and AI. Last but not least, We'll move on to the Q&A section where we'll go through some frequently asked questions about these new two courses. And we'll also invite you to share any questions or doubts that you might have about CCI or about the two BSc courses. And we'll do our best to answer to all these questions during the Q&A section. Before we continue, if you have difficulties following along the session, please know that the entire session is being recorded and it will be re-uploaded on CCI YouTube with English closed captions. So don't worry at all if you miss any detail, you'll have the opportunity to catch up at your own pace too after the session. Uh, ends today. So let's get this started. We'll begin by watching a video that will walk you through all the facilities here at CCI. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the CCI facilities tour. Over the next few minutes, we are going to show you around the campus and tell you a bit about the facilities and resources available to our students. CCI South London is located across two buildings along Peckham Road in Camberwell. We share our buildings with Camberwell College of Arts, which is a fantastic opportunity for CCI students to get to know and collaborate with students studying courses like fine art, photography, graphic design and illustration. The Green Coat Building hosts teaching spaces and technical spaces for students studying creative computing and creative robotics. It also hosts the Dark Lab for AR, VR and Interaction Design. This summer, we are going to be creating additional technical spaces in this building to support the new creative robotics courses that open in September 2023. CCI is located on the fifth floor of Peckham Road, where we have teaching spaces and technical labs, as well as a kitchen, which is our main student hangout and study space. We have several high-spec workstation computers where you can work on machine learning, data science and other intensive computing tasks. We have a library on site with access to a range of books, ebooks, periodicals, and databases. Our dedicated librarian, Beninia, ensures that these resources are kept up to date to help you complete your studies. Across the courtyard is Gardens House, one of a growing number of halls of residence across London. And on the ground floor is the Learning Zone, a space for self directed study that is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to all UAL students. There are places to eat, like our canteen student advice center and support services, and an art and material shop. In summer 2023, we will redevelop the former London College of Fashion building at High Holborn. We will share this building with UIL's brand new PhD hub, which will help to ensure that CCI's focus remains around the development of world-class research. At our Holborn site, we will create new technical, teaching and library facilities to support our new courses in computer science and data science. The technicians here at CCI all have a decade of experience doing really cool stuff with emerging technology. We'd love to help the students here with any questions they have about their projects. 
The Dark Lab is for experimenting with interaction, projection, sound, and VR. Great for permanent projection setups. We've got a couple of VR booths. We've got loads of speakers and many other toys to play with. I specialize in creative coding and especially interactive things using Kinect and cameras and game engines, 3D graphics. We have a whole bunch of equipment that students can take out on loan, including projectors, Kinect. We also have laptop lockers where you can get a laptop to work with. Physical computing really is just the connection to the physical world, to the data. Students have, have played with physical computing in all sorts of different ways, a lot of interaction with gaming and the VR world as well. Sensing various different bits and pieces, using touch especially, all sorts of different sensors uh, to put things in a virtual world or vice versa, so they could have things coming from a virtual world and bringing them into the real world. We generally lend Arduinos to all of the students and with that we have a collection of different modules. This allows us to interact with the world in various different ways. Those modules could be sound sensing, they could be image sensing, they could be sensing the environment in some other way. But the benches here are for the students to solder and uh, prototype, put different boards together. We have different components with different levels of exploration with electronics, so you can quickly get something together on breadboard or you might want to make something that's more solid. I help students who want to use the digital knitting machine, the digital embroidery machine, and who are also thinking about incorporating electronics or computation into textiles or wearable kind of technology. We have a silver reed digital knitting machine. Um, so that's a domestic knitting machine that can be computer controlled. So you can use it to create digital patterns and that's used to produce knitted fabric. I tend to think of it like a 3D printer kind of for textiles. And then the other textiles machine that we have is a brother digital embroidery machine. So that's kind of fully automated programmable embroidery machine that you can use to embroider textiles. This is Digital Fabrication Lab and we have 3D printing machine and laser cutting machine here. For our 3D printers, you just drag your design into the software and slicing it and directly push it to the printer and your design will be materialized. For the laser cutter, it's also very efficient, even very complex pattern. It will only take like uh, several minutes. Most of students will use it to um, generate the housing for their physical computing things. It helps students to materialize their project quickly. To find out more about our facilities and equipment, please visit wiki.cci.arts.ac.uk. Now, a lot of students are also interested in finding out more about the research themes that we explore here at CCI and the social mission that underpins our research, teaching and public program activities. In the following video, we will share with you all about it. I hope you enjoy it. CCI's key research themes are creativity, machine learning and AI, human computer interaction and platforms, and big data and digital citizenship. So we're interested in how machine learning and AI can transform people's creative practices, enable the creation of totally new kinds of work in music and art, and enable new people to get involved in creative practice. We've created a lot of software tools like Wekinator, Mimic, and InteractML, which are used by tens of thousands of people around the world to make new music and art and games. We've had staff and students exhibit work that's created with AI at venues like the Whitney and the Barbican, um, and we've had collaborations with artists and musicians like Arca, Massive Attack, and others. A number of staff and students are also leaders in community and activist groups. For instance, the Code Liberation Foundation teaches women and non-binary people how to make games, and the Critical Platform Studies Group explores how digital platforms might encode and even reproduce patterns of problematic power structures in society. This rich and exciting research environment is the product of many staff coming together from lots of different disciplines. These include not just computer science and art, but music, engineering, design, philosophy, art history, and all sorts of other domains. We all bring our excitement and experience from these different research projects with us into the classroom. Uh, and it's a place that I really love teaching and I'm excited to share it with you. 
CCI's teaching, research, and outreach activities are all informed by our social mission. This mission has three components. They are digital inclusion, diversity in technology, and digital entrepreneurship. First, we are committed to the inclusion of marginalized people in the creation of technology and in the use of technology. This informs what we teach both in the classroom and beyond the classroom. It also means that we have to recognize that the lack of diversity in the tech workforce right now both uh, stems from and contributes to broader problems in our society, and we have to address these too. Secondly, we're really mindful about the impacts that technology has on the broader world. We have to recognize the potential harms that come with technology, whether that means um, harms to well-being or even exacerbating bias and inequality. At the same time, we're very involved in projects that aim to have a more positive impact on the world. We are collaborating with the Decolonizing Art Institute at UAL right now to try to surface and mitigate bias in museum collections across the UK. We have staff and students, some with disabilities themselves, who are making technologies that enable new ways for disabled people to interact with technology and create new forms of technology for themselves. And third, CCI is committed to creating digital entrepreneurship opportunities for marginalized people. If we want tech to be a force for good, we need to enable people to apply technology in ways that they're excited and passionate about, where they know technology is going to be useful. So this means applying creative computing to new application areas, to addressing needs in people's communities, and to affecting social change. The Creative Computing Institute's public program can be anything from talks, workshops, short online tutorials, conversations, and it's really aimed at engaging with the community outside of our students. Students join in it too, but it's very much for the general public. The reason I run it with so much passion is because it's a part of my ongoing research and practice, which is about including unheard voices in technology development. I think that we've got as much to give communities as we can learn as an institution from communities. And so engaging with the general public is engaging with users and having that dialogue, that critical dialogue, and then coming back and designing software and hardware from a more informed position is really important. I would love to tell you a little bit more about TechYard. It's a huge part of the CCI's public programme and I've been running it for almost three years now. So it started in the pandemic as an online tutorial course for young people and now it's grown into a hybrid program. We go into schools, we run workshops here at the CCI, we collaborate with galleries all around London and hopefully soon beyond. And again, it's the ethos of engaging people outside of our student cohort with the critical creative computing conversation, ethics, and of course, like skills as well, right? So we can run 3D modeling workshops, virtual reality workshops, and we work with beyond young people now. So I do loads of stuff for young people, but also done some work with adults as well. Examples of past public program workshops that we've run include inclusive design in wearable technology, designing a feminist chatbot, and queering voice AI trans-centered design. I hope you enjoyed what you just saw and got you excited about studying here at CCI with us. That's all from me for now because it's time to invite Vali to this virtual space. So we're going to add her here. Hello, Vali. The floor is yours. <laughs> uh, hi, Georgina. And thanks. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. And also, uh, welcome, everyone. It's fantastic to have you here today and be able to talk about the BSc in computer science and our BSc in data science and AI. I'm Vali Laliotti. I'm the uh, director of programs for CCI. And I'll just share with you a short presentation. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Okay. So I hope you the slides are okay coming uh, coming through. Um, I'm uh, I'm the director of program for CCI, and um, uh, as you can see, my own background is actually computer science. I have a PhD in computer science, so it's really a pleasure to introduce the BSc in computer science at CCI. Uh, I also have this multidisciplinary background, having an MRes in design from the. College of Art and also an MBA. 
And you would expect that from most of the staff that I, I manage, most of our academic staff come with that kind of multidisciplinary background. The, the courses I'm leading uh, are the existing nine ones. Um, and these spread all the way from a BSc and MSc in uh, creative computing, all the way to diploma and MRes in creative computing, uh, an MA in internet equalities and so forth. And it's fantastic to be here today because we're introducing also six new programs and today we, I'm going to be talking about specifically the BSc in computer science and the BSc in data science and AI. Uh, these will all start in September 2023. Uh, so really excited about, um, about this opportunity to speak to you about the programs. Let me tell you a little bit about my background, because uh, I am, as I said, a computer scientist. I started way back in 1996 uh, when I finished my PhD in computer science in the UK. I moved to Germany, where I, I worked with the very early systems on virtual reality. These were, you know, room size systems, and I've used them both in Germany for applications in, uh, uh, for example, in health and surgery and so on. And then also I moved as a professor of computer science in South Africa uh, during the Mandela presidency, which was an amazing uh, period for change in South Africa. And I was teaching then virtual reality, bringing some of uh, paintings from traditional um, African um, backgrounds into, into virtual reality. Uh, continued that kind of research when I moved back into the UK and worked for the BBC. I brought the, the very first augmented reality productions uh, in the screen and got um, a Royal Television Award for, for that uh, work. Uh, continuing uh, my multidisciplinary work, I also worked in robotics. And so I'm bridging that sort of immaterial world of uh, virtual reality with a very tangible um, robotics side of things. And that's uh, work I've done when I was uh, doing research in the Royal College of Art during my MRes and beyond. And we produced, uh, you know, a, a robotic steering wheel. Uh, it was caught up in a Wired a magazine article. I continue doing this type of uh, dual research um, uh, and from uh, UAL, which I joined uh, two, two years ago. Uh, an example of that is a platform that uh, I created uh, first with my company and then with the university uh, during the COVID years, uh, when everybody was locked up uh, in our houses, uh, all the performers also similarly. And uh, this platform enables uh, performers to perform from home uh, as if they are in, um, in music halls, concert halls, theaters, with the visuals and the acoustics of those spaces. So that gave the opportunity for talent that was uh, locked at home, like all of us, uh, to perform, rehearse, and for us to enjoy some of those performances during the lockdowns. We continue to use this kind of uh, uh, system and platform uh, to engage with uh, uh, the public. Uh, this example is uh, from uh, the Royal College of Music where we used it as an augmented reality um, program, an augmented reality application where visitors could play drums with an amazing um, array of uh, precursionists uh, that they were seeing through their headsets. The, the work continues in that, uh, in that sense and uh, with robotics as well. But today I want to talk a little bit about what is CCI uh, and of course talk a little bit more about what specifically we're going to be teaching and how in our BSc in computer science and the BSc in data science and AI. So the Creative Computing Institute is one of four institutes at the University of the Arts, London. Uh, we are the most, uh, the younger one. We've been now running for four years. 
And uh, we are expanding and growing, as you saw, very, very quickly. Uh, we are the part of uh, the University of the Arts London that is uh, exploring uh, computational technologies and the intersection of creativity and technology. This is the way that UAL expo explores technology that is shaping our world, but also uh, in that way leading the new generation of talent that will shape the world through technology. For us, it's very important that computer science and creative practice come together. And for me, uh, I feel extremely um, at home to actually be in an institute that promotes exactly that mix of computer science and creativity. Uh, it was important to me when I was teaching earlier on in pure computer science departments, and it's even more important today because the kind of problems that our world is facing uh, are problems that need this interdisciplinary approach. It needs creativity and computer science coming together. And this is why we're here today to talk about BSc in creative um, in, cre in computer science and the BSc in data science and AI. And why are these happening in the University of the Arts London? Uh, I think you've heard a bit about our research and the topics that we are researching. I shared with you a little bit of my research in virtual augmented and extended reality. And it's important to know that these are embedded and, and uh, in our social mission. And it's very important to understand that computer science and data science and AI research and teaching are really taking that bigger perspective of digital inclusion, diversity in technology, and digital entrepreneurship. So why computer science and data science and AI degree? Why would you do a degree like this in an arts university? And this is very important, and I'm sure that you're here because you understand that computer science, data science, and AI need creativity and creativity needs that kind of technical challenge and talent to solve the difficult problems that our societies are facing and our planet is facing and to create a more just and fair society for all. Uh, this is why it's important to have computer science and data science and AI infused with the ways and creative pedagogies that the Creative Computing Institute is by now very well known in, in using and, uh, and in effectively teaching creative talent um, those skills. So having answered that bigger question, uh, I want to dwell into the detail of what the BS in computer science and what the BS in data science and AI will look like. Now, I understand, I don't ex expect you to absorb this uh, complicated image in one go. Far from that, it is color coded uh, because we are creative after all. Uh, but this shows you in just one image what your three or four years uh, with us as a BSc in computer science would look like. And um, you would see each year on a row um, with units uh, for each uh, term block one and block two. But the most important thing I want to share with this slide uh, is how we fit all the units together. So let's talk colors. The, the orange color that you see here, all the units that are color coded with orange are units that will give you the programming skills. And you will see that it starts with foundational programming one, two, and continues to coding one and two, three and four, five, and the ethics of computer at the end of it. So there is a continuum stream of teaching you the programming skills that you need across each year. And it's all color coded with orange. The second stream of learning builds on that and starts around the history of computing. Uh, builds some of the foundational maths you're gonna need 
uh, during the, the, the beginning of your year zero. And that's uh, blue colored. So all the blue units that you see in this picture uh, target the link between technology and humans. So you will see things like human factors and introducing inclusive human computer interaction, talking about ethics and security, talking about interfaces and how human and machine work together and computational entrepreneurship. So these units are the blue units uh, building on top of your uh, skills in pure coding and programming with the understanding of the bigger picture of how technology is used in the society and how humans interact with it. And then there is the blue, the, sorry, the green uh, line of units. And all these units are practical units. This is where the hands-on fun uh, exists. And it, they're using both your understanding of technology in society and your coding skills to create projects that enable you to go beyond the code uh, to web programming, uh, data and databases programming, software engineering, and product development all the way to the fourth year or the third year um, in creating a final project which combines all that you've learned into a full uh, unit, 40 credits unit, that uh, eventually uh, becomes the, the piece of work that you're going to show also on our final show. And I'll talk about that in a moment. It's a lot to capture in this image, but the, the so think of the colors. And also I wanted to sh show you that there is, I spoke about a year three or a year four. This means that you have an opportunity of an optional year at, at year three of your studies. Uh, and we very proactively engage with the industry so that we give you that opportunity and support you through spending an optional year with the industry, working uh, with companies like Google, uh, IBM, uh, Apple, and uh, smaller, more creative companies as well. Um, and we have seen a lot of our uh, BSc students already engaging with this kind of um, uh, industry. And also we know that um, you will be, uh, you know, enjoying a year building this understanding of uh, working uh, in terms of computer science with your, with industry. Very similarly, uh, data science and artificial intelligence share a same story. The narrative around our pedagogy and the courses is the same, coded in, uh, in orange for the foundational programming courses, and then in blue for bringing in this understanding between um, data science and AI history and how it affects and works with society and the ethics and, um, and data governance that are necessary for uh, BSc in data science and AI. And finally, the green units are the ones that uh, you build projects uh, combining the understanding of those units. So you, you build um, computing one, you uh, build data representation and visualization projects, uh, projects around data, people, and society. And again, finishing up with a final data science project, uh, which is your uh, where you combine everything that you've learned into a final project that is also showed at the final show. Uh, very excited about that. Very happy to um, answer a lot of questions if you have about this. Um, and there may be details of each unit, but I wanted to give you a little bit of excitement uh, from the showcase uh, of, from last year. These are uh, pieces from our BSc in Creative Computing and our diploma students. And you would expect that you were able as a computer scientist or a data scientist and AI BSc to come up with things like this or, or more advanced also maybe. 
because uh, some of these pieces are diploma, so just out of one year. Uh, but I just wanted to share this to give you an understanding of the variety of the experience that you will get at the BSc uh, Computer Science and at the BSc Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. So you would see here examples. Let me take the middle one and explain that. Um, this is a, a student that uh, got uh, photographs uh, of a slaughterhouse of a, of a, in, and then feed an AI program with that, um, feed a lot of these images through and created uh, different paintings, uh, images that were produced through the AI and through those got inspiration to produce an actual painting. So that's what you see in the middle picture there, going from uh, inspiration from the real world to inspiration that an AI produced into a, a final painting. Uh, another, another way to look at that, maybe another example is the one uh, with a ping pong that you see there, uh, which was generating music out of tracking people's movement with their, with their rackets. And um, Another one, very physical uh, one, is on the right-hand side. It's a robotic, uh, um, a robotic example of um, uh, tracking people. You can see a little camera there and uh, moving depending on, on the surrounding uh, people visiting. On more on VR uh, and tracking and more visual representation, you can see those two examples. The one on the right is one that tracks people and creates a, an avatar, virtual avatar, uh, projected on a screen. And that's where our dark lab is. So that's one example. And the one on the left is a more artistic visualization of uh, a very natural, organic kind of processes. Uh, there are examples of uh, more um, sort of physical examples. The one piece on the right is, a, is an armchair that composes music through touching and caressing mushrooms, uh, which are uh, growing inside that chair. Uh, so a lot to have fun with, a lot of, um, uh, I'm sure a lot of questions that you would like to ask. So I don't want to take more of this time. I want to leave space for us to, to use for questions and answer. So I'd like to thank you very much for, for this opportunity to present CCI and the details of our BSc in, uh, in um, uh, computer science and also our BSc in data science and AI. Thank you. Thank you, Vali, for your insightful presentation. Just a quick note uh, to acknowledge that given that we've been relying on color coding to tell you more about the course units, if you would like us to provide a version of the course unit charts in a format for colorblind and or partially sighted viewers, you can email us at cci at arts.ac.uk and we will happily send it to you. Now, I would like to welcome to the space our colleague, Professor Rebecca Fibring and she will give us a presentation about research on data science and AI with some related examples. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Georgina. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you today. Um, here at CCI, we really are uh, a world leader in creative machine learning and data research. I've got a whole list of, of firsts here. I'll read some of them off to you. Um, people associated with C CCI have made the first interactive machine learning application named at Creative Industries back in 2009, the first online course or MOOC in the world on creative machine learning, um, the first piece of video art produced by Deep Learning, which was purchased by a major museum, um, first uh, first funded UK project, research project, exploring deep learning for generative media. Um, first interactive machine learning system for pro professional games developers. So we've, we're really active as researchers in these areas. And of course, here at CCI, there's not a big gap between research and teaching. Um, most of us doing research in these areas are also bringing that into the classroom with us. Um, so there's three themes I want to talk to you about today in terms of data and AI research. The first is all the research happening here on developing new ways to use AI in creative practice in multiple domains. Um, I'll just show some, some highlights and give you names of people. If this looks exciting and you want to look up their work, uh, please 
feel free. Um, the first is Mo Akin, who did his PhD supervised by Mick Grierson, who you're going to hear from next. Um, Memo is very well known as a digital artist, and he did some pioneering work with uh, deep learning. Um, this is one example of a piece. Um, one of the first uses of what we would call an image to image or pix to pix model that ran in real time. And Memo made this really beautiful, essentially instrument out of this piece where on the left, he's manipulating objects in front of his webcam. And on the right, a uh, machine learning system is re-rendering these as, for instance, pictures of the ocean. Um, or I'll show you another example of pictures of fire or pictures of flowers. Um, Terence Broad, um, he did the auto-encoding auto Blade Runner work, which uh, has been shown at uh, Whitney, uh, Guggenheim, I believe. He's done some really fantastic work within his PhD, um, making new advances in exploring how machine learning can be used in uh, new types of visual and video art. Um, he's actually now a senior lecturer here, so he's somebody you might be learning from if you came to do a degree with us. Um, this is a project from a master's student in data science and AI for the creative industries. Uh, Nan Zhao built a generative image model on ancient Chinese cave paintings and then built an app where you can take a selfie of yourself and you know, turn yourself into a cave painting. Um, these images you're going to see in the video um, are from a collaborative work in progress by a team of CCI academics. Um, they're using text-to-image diffusion models, which are really popular right now. Um, but they're not just saying, oh, I'm going to type in a prompt and see what kind of art gets created. Um, they're approaching this with a, a really critical and technical uh, lens. They're in, in this piece using the models to act as an art critic, uh, interpreting the images provided to it. Um, a lot of our uh, researchers are also involved in music. Mick Grierson, who you'll hear from next, uh, worked with Massive Attack to um, remix one of their one of their records using a neural network. Um, and this piece was shown at the Barbican and is now on a multi-year world tour. My postdoc, Gabrielle Viglianzoni, um, is an active musician who's uh, doing a lot of work right now exploring how we can do gestural control of live audio synthesis models driven by machine learning. So not just make new sounds that you might generate if you want to generate a new song, but thinking about how you might control these sounds um, with your body in real time. Um, Gabrielle's especially interested in um, making music with machine learning that comes from a variety of cultures. He's interested in making Latin American and African rhythms as well as maybe more traditional uh, electronic dance music and, and developing AI systems specifically targeting those genres. The second theme of research I want to mention to you is around making AI usable. Now, the creative works I just showed you require a lot of technical expertise and innovation, um, understanding and changing the guts of how machine learning algorithms work, uh, building new implementations that work in real time, understanding and manipulating the complicated data streams that we get from video or music or human motion. Uh, and a lot of our research work has explored how to make these kinds of innovations accessible and usable to people in the real world, not just other researchers, not just computer scientists. So I'll give you some highlights of this. Um, I have a project called Wekinator, which was developed originally in 2009. Um, this was the world's first interactive machine learning tool for creative practice. And it's been used uh, by tens of thousands of people to create new musical instruments, live performances, and interactive art. And it's still very widely used, including in professional performance and art contexts, as well as teaching at lots of universities. Um, the Mimic project, you can go to online and check this out. This is another tool that we've developed to enable people to experiment with generative of um, machine learning algorithms and other types of machine learning algorithms in music. And this has been uh, a tool that we use a lot in our teaching. InteractML uh, is a tool that was just uh, released for Unity and Unreal game engines uh, last year. We've got, again, tens of thousands of users and people starting to do some really interesting things um, within game and virtual environments. Um, Sound Control is another program that uses machine learning to build instruments for kids with disabilities, along with music teachers and therapists who might be working with them. So they can build customized uh, musical instruments as well as games and other sorts of interactions for themselves. The last thing I want to mention is uh, changing society. A lot of our work here at CCI around data and AI aims to change the world for the better. We have a number of projects um, around this theme. Uh, first of all, uh, Mick and I and a number of our colleagues are working with the UALD Colonizing 
Decolonizing Arts Institute on a, a big new grant um, with museums like the Tate. And we're focusing on um, using machine learning to surface bias in museum collections around the UK, as well as mitigate that bias and enable historians and curators and the public to um, interact and explore works of art uh, by especially artists of color in new ways. Um, several of our staff members here, our researchers, are active in shaping public policy and funding around AI. For instance, advocating for more funding for AI in the creative industries. Or, for instance, other staff are involved in activism around AI and data, uh, helping to produce reports such as this one from No Tech for Tyrants. Uh, we're really active in, um, as I mentioned, taking lessons we learned from our research and thinking about how this should change teaching. How might these tools be useful for teaching people in creative industries, in computer science, people in the general public? Um, we've done a lot of work to make a lot of our teaching open um, and accessible to thousands and thousands of people around the world. Um, we have a set of MOOCs on FutureLearn, for instance, um, introducing students to creative AI, um, as well as engaging in activism for social change in tech. This course is also quite AI and data focused. And of course, there's larger offerings that aren't just data and AI, but also other forms of computer science and tech that I invite you to check out. That's it from me. Thanks, Rebecca, for your presentation. Now it's time to welcome Professor Mick Grierson, who will talk us uh, through the research on computer science at CCI and show us some exciting projects as well. Hi, everyone. Great to see you and uh, welcome to this open day. It's great to be able to talk to you. I want to start by thinking about what computer science research is. One common way of defining computer science research is that it's a branch of science that seeks to determine what can and cannot be automated. This is one way of thinking about it. That depends on a lot of things. For example, the task or the process, the kind of computer you're using, and also who are using, you know, the person who's using those computers. All of that matters. So computing research can be just about computers. For example, how we change the way computers are created and used. This can include how and why we make computer hardware a certain way and how and why we develop software for any particular purpose. So, Another way of thinking about computer science can be about how, they imp how it impacts how we approach science and society outside of just operations of computers. This is sometimes called interdisciplinary computing, and that's a very strong strand, as I'm sure you've already heard here at CCI. Some people think of this as a form of applied computer science, but part of the problem with this is that computers are almost everywhere and used by almost everybody. There obviously are people where that's not the case, and that's an interesting set of questions in itself. Also, the way we understand how people use computers can change the way computers work. For example, on the left, we have the iPad. On the right, we have iPhone 1. One of the main differences between these two devices was that the animation, the physics-based animation feedback changed how people felt about interacting with the touchscreen. And the rest is history. This changed what computers do, what they, um, uh, why they did it that way, and where they might be used. So, We've been trying to do similar kinds of research, thinking about not just this question of what can be automated, but why you would use a computer in a certain way, how you can change computer usage. And one of those questions that we think about a lot in computer science is, for example, making an accessible platform. This means working with users. Sometimes we think of users as, as kind of participants in experiments, but also we might think of them just as other people. And further, furthermore, we might think of those people as co-researchers. So people that we work with and that we talk to and that we try to understand and to kind of partner with. So they research alongside us. So that's a perspective in computing research. For example, we worked for several years with a community organization of learning disabled and autistic people called Heart and Soul. Um, it, funded by the Wellcome Trust in order to understand how we can support them to come up with communication tools to help them explain to people how they felt about the world. This led us to creating a new accessible platform which allowed them to reach out, ask questions of the public, collect information from people in new and accessible ways. This allowed them, again, to, in a way, conduct their own research project on the public to understand how the public saw them and to gauge how the public reacted to their issues. A PhD student of Rebecca Feebrink, Katie Wolf, 
did a very similar thing in terms of making it more easy for people to explore sonifications um, in their Twitter stream. For example, by mapping Twitter streams to different kinds of electronic music sonification or manipulating the, um, the electronic music soundtrack in real time, allowing audience members to interact and change how different performers materials were uh, actually being heard. Another PhD student of Rebecca's, Reed Oda, created a system that would allow people to play music across the internet by predicting when they were hitting an instrument so that when the arm of the, when the mallet was moving in this direction, the camera would be able to guess when it would actually hit the instrument and then adjust the playback latency between two performers across the internet, the latency being the delay so that it both sound, it sounded in time to both people. Petra Kirk, another PhD student who worked with me, has been working with UCL Hospital to try to understand how you can motivate stroke rehabilitation through sound feedback. And this means using a camera to measure when someone is doing their exercises with their hand, a particular forward reach exercise, which is very useful for stroke victims, and use a, a system so that if their hand is in the wrong position, it issues sonic feedback. In this case, it stops the music that they're listening to. And this speeds up considerably how much, how quickly they adjust their arm so they can keep listening to music whilst they do their exercise. Very simple, but works a treat. Daniel Berrier, who's a PhD student who uh, has been working in collaboration with one of my other PhD students, built a system which would allow you to do a style transfer from one kind of handwriting to another. So you could write in one graphic stylized form, for example, as a graffiti artist, and then apply a transfer to that in order to, to make it look like the style of another. So this is about modeling human movement in the way that we actually draw in a design context and has lots of applications. Terence Broad, whose work um, Rebecca was talking about in res with respect to artificial intelligence, has been doing quite a lot of work understanding how to create and repair new kinds of 3D images. And this paper was published at SIGGRAPH which takes, uh, it takes 3D images where there are things in the way and it removes those things, not just in one part of the image, but across all the different depth maps of the image. And it uses the depth map to work out, i.e. how far away something is, to work out how it can be extracted automatically. Another PhD student of Rebecca's, Timea Farkas, has been exploring how to, make, uh, how to use technology to make board games more immersive working with player research as a now a, a member of staff. So has come out of her PhD and gone straight to working in industry, designing board game experiences using technology that reflect people's experience and enhance the uh, immersion of, that, of the gaming process. So that's another way of thinking about how you can use technology to enhance and change the way games feel for people. Another PhD student of mine, Ereti Aloe, created a new interface for real-time visuals. This project, it was really just about how do you make a system for people who are creating visuals in a performance environment? Let's say they're at the O2 Arena or they're at Brixton Academy and they're trying to generate visuals which people can use, like everyone can see and which encourages a great atmosphere at the event. What is it that people using that software want? And her research demonstrated that one of the features that those people really wanted was to be able to get more information from the audio track in real time to apply to the graphical, the, the computer graphics systems that they were controlling. So that's what she did. She built a system which would allow them to extract what we call features from the audio stream and use it to control different kinds of computer graphics visuals for real time performance. Another thing we can think about, as I've already mentioned, is how to make new kinds of hardware. This is a hardware device that I uh, collaborated with a colleague, Chris Kieferon. He's a lecturer, senior lecturer at Sussex. This interface uh, was a small Bluetooth device many, many years ago that would um, interact with an iPad. Just after the iPad came out, we built this thing. And the idea was that it would allow people who were, in, in particular, nonverbal autistic um, co-researchers to use a tactile interface in order to communicate on the iPad to actually select sentences rather than just using the touchscreen. And that's because some of them didn't actually have, some of the people we worked with didn't have the fine motor control to actually use the touchscreen without creating lots of errors. And they found a tactile interface much easier. 
So that was many years ago, but it, now we find this kind of these sorts of tactile interfaces are quite common because of the easy way you can connect them to smart devices. Another thing that we talked about as well was software. And one of the important things about software isn't just the software that we use, it's the soft, it's the way we make software. So in computer science research, the way that we support software development and the programming languages that people use, they're an area of research that we're interested in. In particular, creating new programming languages and platforms. And quite a lot of the work that we've done over the years has been in trying to make programming more of an interactive task. Here, we created a system called CodeCircle, which we've now baked into the Mimic platform that Rebecca was talking about earlier. And we found that this allowed students to correct errors and programmers to correct errors more quickly because of they're, more, they're treating programming as an interaction loop. Uh, we also got really, really good stats, which helped us understand how people would like to use platforms like this. Um, you know, we've also, that kind of led us to a conclusion about how errors are really crucial in the way you respond to an error helps create a, a way in for you to fix your code, which other kinds of um, development environments don't allow. Finally, we do do quite a bit of work in XR and VR, including some of the work that Rebecca already mentioned, Interactamel being one of those. And Valley also mentioned work that she'd been doing in this space for a long, long time. More recently, we've been working with Ukrainian universities and universities in Ireland to create a system which makes it easier for people, that would mean ordinary people who aren't computer programmers, to develop interesting, real-time, interactive XR spaces more easily. It might be easier for people to use VR and XR if the way we create it is made more simple. So we've been building a platform in collaboration with the Ukrainian universities uh, in order to understand how we can get people who have really strong craft skills into a situation where they can create their own interactive XR env environment and experience without needing to learn how to program. So hopefully that gives you some idea of the kinds of work that we've been doing and uh, the kinds of research which drives the computer science program that we are putting together here at UAL. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mick, for your presentation. Now we've got around 15 minutes for the Q&A and I will invite again Vali, Rebecca and Mick to join me here. Hello, everyone. So we've got some frequently asked questions with us, but um, are super happy to pick up any doubts or other questions that might come up um, for you. So please feel free to send us any questions or comments on the YouTube chat and we'll do our best to cover it all. So shall we start with the first one? So the first one that we receive quite a lot is, what exactly is a data scientist and a computer scientist? Who would like to go for this one? I don't mind starting. Perfect. So um, I think this data science BSc program is one of the first data science undergraduate programs in the country. But the reason why we're starting it is because there are an awful lot of people who are, come from industry who ask us again and again, you know, have you got data scientists for us? And what they really mean is, have you got people who can understand the data which is coming in and out of our business and help us make decisions about uh, what we do with that data? And that's one way of thinking about a data scientist, but there are others. It might be that there are kinds of science where you rely on huge amounts of data, which is coming from various places like climate science, for example, or health science. Data scientists know about algorithms, data structures, and other computer science principles, and also artificial intelligence principles. They know about them in a way which other scientists don't, and they can support the use of that data to help inform decisions about, for example, who, you know, who is more likely to be sick in a pandemic, or and where you put your care, or for example, um, what kinds of issues are affecting climate and how we might mitigate against them. So that's a few examples about Data science, I think with computer science, obviously data science is a, an AI, they're, they're part of computer science, but computer science more generally is, as I mentioned before, often described as a way of thinking about how we decide what we can automate. What is it that the computer is and what can it support human activity with and how do we structure that? And computer scientists work on that kind of problem. Thank you, Mick. 
Would someone else like to add something on that front? I'll, I'll add something just very quickly. I think there's often a misconception among people that computer science means programming and getting a computer science degree means programming. Um, and to an extent, that's true. I mean, personally, I think programming is one of the most fun um, aspects of studying computer science and being a computer scientist in the world because you get to make things. But computer science itself is much broader than that. It spans an understanding of, you know, the, the hardware, what, you know, how does a computer work to thinking about computers in human contexts, everything from how do you make computing systems secure to how do you design computing systems that people actually find usable, um, as well as, you know, sort of the abstractions, the ways of thinking that um, are helpful to um, develop when you start to think how might I actually build a pro computer program to do something complicated? So it's it's more than programming, and a lot of it's really fun. Thank you, Rebecca. I've got the next one for you, Bali. And this one says, what's the main difference between the two courses, the two BSCs? Uh, thank you. Yes, that's a very important uh, decision that you have to make, which, which of the two. And I think it is very, um, very interesting that uh, Rebecca and Miko touched on that. Um, there is a very strong um, uh, focus, if you like, on data science. And uh, when, when we're talking about the, B, the BSc in data science and AI, so if you're interested to understand data, uh, be able to use data and artificial intelligence in, in ways that support the society, solve problems in, uh, in organizations and uh, in the for climate and for health and so on, for this type of application. So if your focus and what excites you is about the information data and about what can be automated through artificial intelligence, then the BSc in data science and AI is the one you should be applying for. Uh, in terms of the computer science, as Rebecca also mentioned, is, is maybe a more holistic. There will be things around artificial intelligence in it, in some of the units, uh, but it, it will cover more broadly um, how technology can uh, can be used uh, and how you can build skills on programming, uh, on, uh, on actually uh, building applications, for example, and more broadly than, than focusing on only data science and artificial intelligence. So if you want to get a much broader understanding of computer science and build skills that uh, bridge you know, beyond artificial intelligence into examples with virtual reality, for example, or physical computing, then computer science will enable you to do that. Thank you, Vali. Beautiful. So moving on to the next question we've got. How will these courses help me orient my career into creative STEM? Who would like to pick this up? I can talk about that maybe. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite interesting because looking at what our graduates um, are going into, you know, we have uh, already a few years of graduates uh, getting into jobs. And I understand that career and what you do after your BSc is very important, is, is a very important part of your decision on what to study. So uh, it, it enables you. So where we see our current uh, graduates and alumni being absorbed, um, a lot is on tradition, what we would think traditional um, technology companies. So pure STEM, so science and technology and engineering companies. But we also see, of course, um, because of the orientation of uh, creative computing, we also see a lot of our graduates being absorbed within uh, creative industry. So agencies, um, design agencies, uh, companies that are working with uh, more creative aspects of technology. And finally, we also have our graduates uh, normally being absorbed uh, by doing their own, their own companies, their own creative agencies their own um, you know, technology companies. And uh, for that, specifically the BSc in computer science and also the BSc in data science and AI, we have created a unit that is called, uh, it's giving you that entrepreneurial background. So together with um, activities that the Brota UAL does in terms of incubation and CCI supports through, through this process, 
we also building digital entrepreneurs, creative digital entrepreneurs. Thank you, Vali. Beautiful. So we've got the next question, which we've, we have already touched on, but it would be really nice maybe to highlight it a little bit more. What, what is the value of studying these two BSCs at CCI? What, what does make CCI such a unique environment to study these topics at? Who would like to pick this one up? I Valley. All yours. Think, thank you. I'll start with that because for me, uh, that's how computer science should be taught anyway. Uh, and I say that as a computer scientist that uh, was teaching way back and for many, many years. And it's exciting to see that really the more creative pedagogies are actually, you know, are brought up in, uh, in, the, in degrees like the BSc in computer science and the BSc in data science and AI. Um, so I think my answer to this question is, it is the way that any other department should be teaching computer science and data science and AI. So what makes CCI so unique about that is because we have a, a, an amazing way of taking uh, students that have even not really worked with uh, computer science before and, uh, and teaching them within a short span of time uh, skills that are STEM skills. So they are computer science skills, they are artificial intelligence and data science skills. And we have seen that propagating across all our nine current courses, which are the BSc in creative computing and the MSc and so on. So we have a tried and tested and successful pedagogy that enables us to bring a unique environment for our students to learn STEM skills like computer science and data science and AI. Thank you, Vali. Rebecca, yeah. I'd like to add to that. I, I think that's that's such a good way of putting it, Vali, to say, you know, this is, we're teaching computer science and data science the way we think it should be taught everywhere. Um, but that's not always the case. And, you know, I'm also a computer scientist by training. My, I have an undergrad in computer science, a PhD in computer science. Um, and I've taught and worked in very conventional computer science departments as well. Um, but I think one of the things I love about working at CCI and teaching at CCI is that we're not here to build technology for its own sake. We're not here to study technology for its own sake. I think everybody here is um, passionate about technology or questions around technology because of the role that it plays in the real world. Um, we're really interested in using technology in a really wide variety of application domains. And we see students coming in with backgrounds and interests that aren't just necessarily tech. We see that as a real strength in our students. We, we wanna nurture that. Um, that's, you know, everybody who teaches here has some different kind of background that we bring in and, and that's valuable. Thank you both. So the next questions that we have are about technical requirements to apply and what is the process for applying to these courses? So let's start with the technical requirements first. Um, could you please tell us a little bit more about who is able to apply to these courses? Yeah, Mick, all yours. So um, I'm uh, going by the advertised criteria, which is what we need to do. And we wanna make sure that it's fair for everybody. But for year one entry to the computer science program, we want grades B, C, C or above at A level and or merit, merit, merit at BTEC Extended Diploma. Um, preferred subjects include computer science and ICT or design and technology. Um, access to higher education diploma with 104 UCAS tariff points. Um, preferred subjects, of course, would also include computer science and ICT or design and technology um, or an equivalent international qualification such as an international baccalaureate diploma. And um, there's also a year zero entry, uh, for which we are looking for grade CC or above at A-level, um, merit pass pass at BTEC extended diploma with preferred subjects, including computer science and ICT, or design and technology, and access to a higher education diploma with 64 UCAS tariff points, um, and or equivalent uh, EU international qualifications, such as an international baccalaureate. So you can see that these requirements are available on the website and the links for these, uh, I think we can put them in the chat in case anyone's looking for them. Thanks, Mick, for going through all the requirements. That's super helpful. 
The next one that we have is around portfolio. So any student who is interested in, in studying at the BSc, um, do they need a portfolio to apply, Vali? Uh, no, you don't need a portfolio to apply. Uh, what you do need is the entry requirements that Mick has just described and your statement. So put some effort in your statement. Tell us why you want to really study with us. What makes this the space where you want to learn computer science and data science and AI? So you don't need a portfolio. Thank you, Vali. Maybe now that we're talking about uh, portfolios, for example, can we just maybe break down a little bit more how the application process works to make it very clear and helpful for anyone thinking about studying with us? Vali, do you think you could? Yeah, you yeah could. of course. Uh, so as Mick said, you, you, uh, you know the entry requirements, but the application process is you apply online, um, this your application, you put your statement in and you put the marks uh, coming in through the UCAS uh, site. And the first phase is that of um, uh, making sure that you meet the criteria. And that is done outside of us. It's our general admissions office that does that. And then those applications are coming through to member of staff uh, and uh, your course leader for the BSc in uh, computer science and the course leader in the BSc of data science and AI and some colleagues like myself, Rebecca and Mick. And then we look through your statements and we look uh, through your, your grades and that's how a decision is made. And that again gets through communicated through the UAL um, process. Thank you, Vali. That's super helpful. The next question we've got is, what sort of work will I get to produce during each of the courses? We've seen some examples about work from students from other courses, but can you maybe tell us a little bit more about what sort of work they'll be producing at these two PSCs? Do you want to go for it, Vali, as well? Yeah, as you said, we've already shared a very, uh, you know, vast, sort of variety of, of examples of existing uh, student work. And um, I think we would, a lot depends on what's the interest of the students that are coming in. Obviously, uh, you will produce something that involves uh, computer science or something that involves data science and AI, but then you are mentored and coached and tutored to use, especially for your final project, to use your interest and and specialize in something that along those courses uh, that really speaks to you. Uh, and I think that that's the beauty of joining us is that you're not uh, just finishing a core computer science or STEM um, degree. You are able to bring your interest, you are able to, be, to bring your passion uh, for technology and society, data science and AI and society into your final project. So it's really up to you, and we are here to support you to do magic with your skills. That's a beautiful answer, Vali. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. OK, so going to the more practical side of things, a lot of students are interested in hearing more about the theory and practice ratio as well within the units that you described um, earlier, Vali. Uh, would you be able to break that down for us a little bit? Yeah, of course. Um, I talked about how we have coded the units, the narrative behind and how we structure it. So you know that in every term, in every block, you will have a very practical unit. So one of the three units at any point will be a practice, um, a practice unit. Um, and there would be two units where we share theory and uh, we share the practice of computer science and data science and AI. So when we teach you, we'll teach you how to program, for example, or how to build an AI, how to build a neural net, and how to program that. So there is, there is a, a strong hands-on practical way of learning theory, the theory of computer science. And, and that we think is the way that it should be taught. Um, we, we want you to understand the theory by actually building things and then reflect on those things. So we use a pedagogy that it's, it's um, reversing, if you like, uh, the common um, teaching example of lecturing and then programming and, and then 
refining what you've done. Um, and um, from very early on, as a, as a professor of computer science, I found this uh, really makes things a lot more uh, approachable, uh, easier to learn because you, you see what, uh, what you can create and then the theory can be understood a lot easier. Um, you talked about ratio, it depends on the unit. Uh, we try to have for each unit a hands-on learning as well as theory learning. So it depends on each unit, uh, that ratio. But it's very important to us to learn through doing. Thank you, Vali. Beautiful. The next question that we have is around work placement. So someone asked us, uh, will there be any opportunities for work placements? I know you mentioned in the course chart that there might be a DPS here. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Vali, do you want to pick it up as well? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm just conscious of time. We have definitely we have one year where you can uh, work uh, work placement, and we support you in that in terms of the administration that is needed. Uh, we engage with companies uh, proactively so that um, you can have more options, and um, you can take that year as a as a work placement year and we encourage and support you through this. Thank you, Vali. Right, so we are coming to an end almost, and I wouldn't like to end the session without asking you this question. What is the CCI community like? Because from my experience, I believe this is one of the most precious things that we can talk about in this session. So who would like to start with this one? <laughs> Make all yours. Speaking as a professor of computer science, I'm, I've been in, uh, I've taught computing for many, many years, uh, almost, you know, over the last two decades, and I've been in different departments, you know, and always across, I've, you know, I've worked in arts departments, and I've worked in computer science departments, and sometimes very vanilla computing departments. When I say vanilla, I mean straight down the line. And I would say that CCI has a culture unlike any other computing department in the whole country. It's entirely unique. It's, uh, and that's why we're here. That's the kind of culture that we want to build. And that's not because we're, we're not different because, for the sake of being different. And we're not different because we can't do what other departments do. We can absolutely do what other departments do. But we choose to be different. We choose to align ourselves with, with, with people, society, and industries that reflect a more diverse perspective of what computing really means. And I'm not saying, I'm not criticizing other courses. I'm just, you know, people can do whatever they like. I'm just saying, if you want a computing experience, which has a much more diverse, much more so, kind of socially and creative focused approach to computer science and data science and AI, then we are that place. You know, also the place where we're going to be putting these courses right in the center of London, you know, right in contact with other computer science programs, particularly at places like King's, and at UCL, you're going to be right in that mixture, but with a very, very different perspective and a really, really different feel. I think, you know, uh, that's the, one of the greatest things. One of the things that excites me most about being here is how unique it is, how different it is. Thank you, Mick. Would you like to add something there, Rebecca, as well? I think Mick said it really well. Just to, <laughs> to sum it up in a few words, I think the community here is diverse. It's engaged. It's passionate. It's a lot of fun. Mm, amazing. And Vali, something else to, to finish? Yeah, it's difficult to add to this. I think both uh, just got it spot on. Um, I think it is also approachable. You know, you might hear professor here, professor there, but actually our offices are open. We are mingled together. We work and support, and that cuts across all of the academic staff, our technical staff, and, um, and anyone that comes to, to teach as a guest lecturer. So thank you, everyone. Um, I would be delighted to, to see you and welcome you next year in uh, one of these uh, courses, the computer science or the data science and AI BSc. Thank you, Vali. Thank you, Mick and Rebecca as well for joining us today. And thanks everyone watching for uh, attending this open day session. I hope it was an insightful and useful presentation and that all your questions about the BSc Computer Science and the BSc in Data Science and AI at CCI were answered. If you want to find out more about the courses and all their details, you can visit artsacuk slash CCI slash new. 
and you'll see all the new courses um, that we have there at CCI. If you have any other particular questions about the courses or CCI, you can also email us uh, at our inbox, cci at arts.ac.uk. Feel free to reach out to share any queries after this session. And we would also like you to invite you to follow us on social media where we share a lot of content and beautiful opportunities and events that we run. You can find us on UAL underscore CCI and we'll be delighted to, to share more content with all of you. We look forward to meeting you in real life very soon. And in the meantime, take care everyone and thank you for your time. Bye-bye.